The first image he showed us was of a subway in Barcelona, filmed at 600 frames per second. He told me he had learned the words Los Olvidados, and unknowingly, upon five syllables, balanced the entire history of Spain at the tip of his tongue. He wrote, a world apart from either olives or finger food, both of which the Spanish do better than any other people in the world. The most apt translation of Los Olvidados would probably be The Forgotten One. He wrote, Two strange things happened to me while I was away in Spain. The first was that I was confronted with the history of forgetting Oxymorons aside, I felt compelled to create a history of the forgotten, a record of banalities, to construct a timeline of moments that might have otherwise been lost. By slowing everything down to a crawl, he said, he hoped to study the exact moment when memory transformed the past back into the present. He wrote, Traditions usually perform this action for us, and what we call culture follows like a reflex. I have become convinced that all of these signs, rituals, going through the motions, the endless cycle of remembering and forgetting, are a process of patchwork, stretching back and forth across the weave of time like darning on an old pair of socks. Remembering is only a temporary fix, wearing again and again at the place of contact. This is the reason why memories, like slippered feet, inevitably stumble into blackness. On New Year's Eve, crowds gather in the center of Madrid at the Puerta del Sol, and everyone listens for the sounds of the clock tower, eating a grape for each of the chimes, twelve in all. Sometimes the traces left behind are the only reliable sources. The gods of scars and stains will not lightly be mocked. But no one remembers where the ritual came from, and so it is impossible to tell exactly what it means. Standing there, he saw each grape symbolically as a month of the year, a compression of time that every year came full circle and was consumed again to fill the void between the chimes at midnight. This is how the Spanish let old acquaintance be forgot. Old Lang Syne, long, long ago. And there it is, every year. He took a train to Barcelona, across a landscape dry and tough and declining like an old woman's hands until reaching the sea. He wrote me, in grade school they taught us the names of all the Spanish kings. I only remember those whose names begin with F. Felipe, Fernando, Ferdinand, married to Isabella, who sent Columbus to America. The monument in Barcelona shows Columbus pointing toward America. The New World, New Spain, lest we forget. Columbus brought all of his baggage with him. I remember the name of Francisco Franco, because we share the same birthday. I've forgotten all the others. My own historical discrepancy? Unimportant? Is it something I'd willed to forget? Sitting at the cafes, it felt like something had been stolen from me, or that I'd misplaced something that I half expected to suddenly find everywhere I looked. Something vanishing into the details of other things, 
like the exact speed of light behind a shadow. 299,792,458 meters per second. I've just looked up the speed of light on the internet, that endless metaphor of memory that remembers everything faster and faster each day. Science tells us that the time is coming when we can have a record of everything, but only if we too are willing to travel at the speed of light. The future will rush to catch up with the past. All will be remembered, and Franco will still be dead. He took a train to Granada, where Federico Garcia Lorca was born. He saw Alhambra high on a cliff. He wrote me, Lorca was executed here, along with a school teacher and two anarchist bullfighters, on a hill just outside of Granada. Some say Lorca's murderers didn't know exactly who he was. Others say that they knew too well. Some say that Lorca's poems precipitated his death, that it was his sexuality, that it was his genius, that it was surrealism the fascist feared most of all. I like to think Dali, that prototypical Andalusian dog, painted persistence of memory in honor of these atrocities. The trouble is, he did so before the war, and after it scuttled like a rat fleeing a sinking ship. But of course, artists are often ahead of their time. They anticipate that reversal of forgetting that suddenly remembers itself before forever vanishing into the web of time, painting a single frozen instant. Cubism comes closest to 24 frames per second. Certain habits of the Surrealists remind me of the mystic shamans, whose job it was in ancient societies to track into the unknown other world to retrieve our collective memories. How can we remember that in this age of computers and data, of instantaneous recall at our fingertips, this age of near-infinite memory, that we too are forgetting some things, that we are capable of disappearing into the details of ourselves? Is it a case of simply lumping things too close together? Green, how I want you green. Green wind, green branches. The ship out on the sea and the horse on the mountain. With the shade around her waist, she dreams on her balcony. Green flesh, her hair green, with eyes of cold silver. Green, how I want you green. Under the gypsy moon, all things are watching her. And she cannot see them. He took a bus a few days later to Cordoba, and the driver gave a Catholic blessing to San Antonin over the intercom. He wrote, the Catholics have a saint for everything, and the Spanish honor them all. San Antonin is the patron saint of pets, missing things, and lost people. In the 10th century, Cordoba was the largest city in the world with a population of half a million. It was built on the ruins of the late Roman and the Christian Visigothic kingdom of Hispania, which was then known under the Arabic name Al-Andalus. Under Muslim rule, three religions came together to build one of the first truly international cities, full of Muslims, Christians, Jews, probably even a few holdover pagans. Africans came up the coast from Gibraltar, commanded by Tariq ibn Ziyad, in the year 711. Now they sell knockoff handbags and pirate DVDs in the streets. He had seen one in the park a few days back in Madrid, jumping down a 15-foot wall to get away from the police. An impressive feat. Even the camera lens wasn't fast enough to catch anything but a fleeting glimpse through the trees. It's called pulling a Santa Claus, because they're always ready to run, bag over shoulder. The intimation is that their bags are full of toys, but another idea comes to light. Saint Nick experiences the world within a frozen instant of time, in the eternal now just before Christmas morning. These men too, just the same, are living in the Zen moment of the now, a state of impermanence where the rug literally might pull up beneath them. This century, they prefer Dolce and Gabbana over cookies and milk. Days later in the evening, he saw another group, en masse, moving through the street. He wrote, It strikes me that they too are forgotten ones, the hardest working and the least considered. If memory follows culture like a reflex, then modernity follows ritual like a vulture, willing to eat everything. So long as it's dead but not buried, nothing will ever go to waste.
He wrote, The Cordoban Mosque was built at a time when Cordoba was described as the jewel of the world, the center of European trade, cooperation, and science, and the mosque was the center of the city. I'm sorry. I should call it La Catedral de Cordoba, as it does on all the tourist brochures. I keep forgetting. The locals still call it La Mosqueta. Christians, Muslims, Jews, living in harmony without bloodshed. So the story goes, but who knows. The great Abd al-Rahman planned to build a place of worship that would rival Mecca, be made a sanctuary for all the religions of the city. When I heard that, the story of the Tower of Babel flashed involuntarily into my mind, and briefly, an image of an archer shooting an arrow into the heart of God, and then, the image of ultimate destruction, Guernica. In Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid, one can take photos of all the works save one, Picasso's Guernica. Painted after the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War for the 1937 World's Fair in Paris, Guernica, that so aptly recalls the sheer madness of all wars, past, present, and future, is, of all the images in Reina Sofia, the one most widely reproduced. It toured the world until it was returned to the Spanish people in 1981, honoring Picasso's wishes that it stay abroad until public liberties and democratic institutions were returned to Spain. What was on Abd al-Rahman's mind at the time he chose to build his mosque atop the Roman ruins to the ancient temple of Janus, whose doors were only open during times of war? In ancient Roman religion and myth, Janus, spelled J-A-N-U-S, was the god of beginnings and transitions, thence also of gates, doors, passages, endings, and time. The internet again. Wikipedia, that ritualistic scholar this time. Did you know the Library of Cordoba was estimated to have held over a million books in 1200 AD? Giannis presided over the beginning and ending of conflict. As a god of transitions, he had functions pertaining to birth and to journeys and to exchange, and hence war and peace. Giannis had a ubiquitous presence in religious rites throughout the year, and was ritually invoked at the beginning of each one, regardless of the main deity honored on any particular occasion. He wrote, Protected under the auspices of devastation from a million tiny flash bulbs, the officials disallow all photography of Guernica. If only the UN could be so decisive. But Guernica cannot be destroyed by taking its image. Flash bulbs only strengthen its horror. When tourists stand in front of Guernica's figures, they give horror a name and a face. The state's refusal to allow individuals the ability to take pictures of the real Guernica only yeah. proves that you have to buy into destruction. Oh, it doesn't do that. It's not inherited. Yeah. Yeah. Destruction out. is officially yeah. authorized. Why? Officially authorized reproductions of officially authorized madness. Democratically approved Guernicas. Gift shop war and gift shop peace. Gift shop madness. If you want anything to do with Guernica, if you want to learn from history, then you have to buy in. And you may have a copy of a copy, but a copy of the original is not allowed. All of the stages Picasso went through, the careful planning, the false starts, the pains to get the emotions of unconscionable suffering right once and for all, to create the painting of war to end all paintings of war. None of these images can be seen in the final version of Guernica, yet they are all in Guernica, buried historical expressions of death and torment more alarming under the surface, because there are also those on top. I'm sure all of this is the exact opposite of what was on Picasso's mind when he sought an expression for the inhuman horrors of the bombing of Guernica, when he painted and repainted the contorted Basque figures that opened Europe's eyes to the anguish and misery of war, the war that was set upon Europe's doorstep and would soon set upon the rest of the world. Giannis opened the gates to World War II, but Picasso was already there warning us before we started. Primal expressions of swallowed alarm of horror felt deep in the belly, sense buried only by time and more war, atomic dust and a thin layer of paint. The ancient Greeks had no equivalent to Giannis, whom the Romans claimed as distinctively their own. He is usually depicted as having two faces, since he looks to the future and to the past. The Romans named the month of January Ionarius in his honor. He wrote me, I was there in the mosque of Cordoba in January 2014 with my shaky camera in the darkness. 
but if it had been left to the Muslims, this court would have been flooded with light. After the Christians took over, they apparently thought it better to plug up the archways. They had hidden away too much gold inside. While filming, it seemed the speed of light itself had crept to a standstill, capturing the images in slow motion through the lens, tearing them away from the pillars as if time were somehow aqueous, coming in waves and salmoning against the current of forgetting, ready to spawn into a million wild and indomitable particles. He wrote, These images, this is where it happened. This is where the history of forgetting grows thick and multi-volume. In the mangled faces of these desecrated saints, so symbolic of conquest, one can see the repetitive ruin and the inevitable patterning over of defeat. Chalky palimpsests thousands of years into liberation. These reliefs, themselves tributes to eternity, to immortality, have in turn been lost to time's ultimate victory dance. A note in an old hand is left illegible beside these faceless blocks of marble, a signature of blood indelibly written in dust. The ceilings tell a significant truth, a difference more of philosophical outlook than merely plaster cast facades. Christians put ornate leaves across all the ceilings, as if trying to elevate the earth to the heavens. On the Muslim ceilings, it is the stars that are elevated. They'll keep the earth where it belongs, on the ground. He wrote, I'd seen the same thing back in Granada, the more famous Alhambra, a place Moorish poets once described as a pearl set in emeralds. On the walls inside, there was little evidence left of the original story. The geometry slid into infinity within a cracked reflecting pool. After the reconquest in 1492, the Christians began to alter the Alhambra as if they were squatting teenagers in an empty flat for the weekend. The open work was filled up with whitewash, the painting and gilding effaced, and the furniture soiled, torn, or removed. Felipe V Italianized the rooms and completed his palace in the middle of what had been the bathhouse. It was from here that Columbus received permission to sail to the New World, and also the place from which the Jews were expelled from Spain, beginning the infamous Inquisition. Just like in the mosque, when all was said and done, the original splendor was left in oblivion. Upon witnessing the completion of the cathedral, Charles V remarked, They have taken something unique in all the world and destroyed it to build something one can find in any city. The only thing neither group could conquer, the Muslims nor the Christians, time, has written over everything in this place and continues to scrawl. He wrote, Apparently we tourists don't mind. We just go on snapping pictures. Those that contain the closest juxtapositions of Christian and Muslim architecture are those most prized, freeze frames of the ultimate reconquest. Perhaps the tourists, in their sacrilege, are the only thing saving this building from the Dark Age. He wrote, Even my video is starting to show signs of history's forgetfulness. Broken up, disjointed in time and space, following multiple ideas around Spain, around the globe, Cordoba, Granada, Barcelona, Madrid, West Africa, Damascus, maybe even back to my home, the U.S. There's no denying I brought all of it with me. Only one such as Jesus can look back through time and see a line so straight and so clear. Here I lived and here I died. The rest will leave up to history to decide. Chris Marker, to whom this film is dedicated, whose memory exists now only as film, once remarked, When men die, they enter into history. When statues die, they enter into art. This botany of death is what we call culture. That's because the society of statues is mortal. One day their faces of stone crumble and fall to earth. A civilization leaves behind itself these mutilated traces like the pebbles dropped by Petit Bousset. But history has devoured everything. An object dies when the living glance trained upon it disappears. And when we disappear, our objects will be confined to the place where we send black things, to the museum.
He writes me, Outside the mosque, pilgrims have become vandals, scrawling epithets in the soft stone. One word catches my eye. Volvemos. We return. What exactly is meant by this, I'll never know. It's been forgotten to time. I'd like to think it was someone like me who spotted the moss cyclic nature of palimpsests, the visions and revisions which time itself will have erased over the centuries. Undoubtedly, though, it will be seen as something political, a Muslim of old Al-Andalus using the language of the conqueror to best him at his own game, to let him know this is not over. We return once more to Madrid. He wrote, that's where the second strange thing happened. An Albanian man approached me in the street near Atocha station and asked if I'd heard the good news of the Prophet Muhammad or Jesus Christ. Yahweh, But I thought twice and decided to chat. I had to ask him in my broken Spanish. Si usted, pero no quiere saber cual? Yes, but don't you want to know which one? It didn't matter to him, he said, just as long as I knew what it was they were speaking about. No se puede vivir sin amar, I said. In time, this has always become misunderstood. And that did it for him. Changing the question made all the difference. He wrote, I sat in front of Luis Buñuel's Los Olvidados for an entire day, watching over and over again the film made in Mexico where Buñuel was in exile in which an entire city forgets that it's dreaming. Franco, too, was forgotten, this time officially. After his death in 1975, the new Spanish government instituted the Pact of Forgetting, a policy enlisted to ensure there would be no prosecution for the crimes committed by Spanish fascists. Los olvidados, those forgotten, would remain forgotten, and the crimes which had caused their forgetting were officially disallowed from ever being remembered. Act of forgetting. Can you imagine that? Sounds like one of those suicide clubs silly Japanese girls might fall in with. 47 million agreeing to forget an entire swath of history. Of course, there were those who refused. Those who couldn't do it. Those who could not bow to the Spanish economic miracle, probably no matter how hard they tried. He wrote me, Franco's dream late at night was for Spain to be self-sufficient. When the democratic nations of Europe formed an embargo against fascist Spain, Franco just boycotted them all right back. And when Europe was cast into chaos during World War II, the Spanish put down their guns and came out of their caves to stare blinking into the sun. What they saw was Franco. By the way, have you ever thought that self-sufficiency was as good a defining characteristic of poverty as any other? Franco never stopped expelling the outsiders, nor pursuing his own interests, cutting all ties and conforming Spain into his perfect vision of Catholic conservatism. Militant dictators are often over-involved in writing the history of forgetting, and so they all end up making the same mistakes as their predecessors again and again. Perhaps Franco was too straight to see that the outsider one cannot expel is the outsider inside, the one which exists within one's very being. While in Museo de Reina Sofia, he also saw a work attributable to Borges up on the wall. One day the artist decided to split himself in two, one side reflecting the past, the pact of forgetting, the other side that of remembering. People on both sides of the street that day had to take note of his strange behavior. But unless they were curious, they would have only seen the side of the story that they were presented with. Finally, a police officer put a stop to the whole thing issuing him a citation in violation of the Pact of Forgetting, to which the artist tore the paper in half, not out of protest, but because he felt issuing half a citation was more appropriate for the act. The street that day reflected the metaphorical rush of memory and forgetting, running parallel to one another, the rush of time running forward and backward on opposite sides of the street, and the history of forgetting drawing everyone's gaze toward the middle, toward the official and the artistic whose accounts of the incident could not be reconciled by halves. In 
In 2007, the Spanish government passed the Historical Memory Law in order to reverse the Pact of Forgetting and honor officially those who'd been forgotten during fascist oppression. One of the first bodies they chose to exhume was Lorca's, but his family protested. Then all of Spain. And then... One last word from Monsieur Macaire, whose stylistic imitation I am convinced is worth its weight in gold. Who said that time heals all wounds? It would be better to say that time heals everything except wounds. With time, the hurt of separation loses its real limits. With time, the desired body will soon disappear. And if the desiring body has already ceased to exist for the other, then what remains is a wound disembodied. A modern inheritance of Janus is in our word janitor, the one who holds all the keys and opens all the doorways, also the one who cleans up after the party's over. Are we conquistadors or custodians of time? He wrote me, when I come back, I want to make a movie about Spain and the history of Los Olvidados, the forgotten ones. Not a film that condemns Spanish history, but one that includes certain details and conveniently omits others. After all, in the future, who will care if I get an F in Spanish history? Failing in just the right way may be the only thing that matters in the brave new world the technocrats are fashioning for us. Remembering and forgetting are anything but binary. He wrote, I'm more interested in dreams than counting sheep. I want to freeze time in order to briefly follow a single detail that would have otherwise gone missing. To follow a single sheep into my dream, all the while leaving the other 99 behind me. I'll call my film, Los Olvidados, The Forgotten Ones. The first image to be shown will be a train pulling into a Tocha station, filmed at 600 frames per second series of images whose only purpose is to document that such an event took place, to remind us that we will all one day be forgotten ones. Find them a conscience declared in an absolute casual sun. Find them a feat declared by the happy thing. Absolute windows, absolute little lives, always tell a wall write a throne, a stone, a desk light, as it may. That which through a cautious power dwells, accidental in passing.